track 15 which is advances in vertical transport part 1 uh, before we start i'd like to just give a very small introduction about myself i am krishan khanna i'm the chairman of a high technology company called uh, i2k solutions we are into artificial intelligence and uh, education i am going to request uh, our first uh, speaker from Kone, Finland, Mr. Johannes de Jong, to uh, give his presentation on elevating issues affecting high-rise buildings in India. Please welcome Mr. Johannes de Jong. It's a pleasure to be here in, in Mumbai again. Uh, it's just been here last month, but uh, back again. It's a fast, fascinating city. It's, it's lovely to see. We've been talking a lot, actually, about infrastructure during these days. And I'm going to continue this. I'm not going to talk about infrastructure in the city, the community. I'm going to talk about infrastructure inside the building. Uh, similar to the roads we have here in, in, in Mumbai, they are congested. I've seen exactly the same happening here in buildings in Mumbai infrastructure not being to the level where it is, where it should be. And uh, there are some simple, basic rules which we use in the Western world. Now, the one thing we normally do pretty damn right in the Western world is infrastructure. And infrastructure of buildings, especially where, where we have automated systems. So, my, my speech will be about infrastructure, uh, actually problems with infrastructure here in Mumbai. I will talk about the following topics there. Uh, left, right, comfort between brackets because I'm not going to talk about that. That's more to do with the product itself. Uh, however, all the topics which are there uh, will influence uh, the, the, the effect, will have effects on right comfort. So it's very important. Now you see some of the highest buildings there in the world uh, which we're doing. And uh, it's always very important to get that traffic right. Uh, those buildings are not easy to, to, to handle. You have to have it right. It's very important that that's done correctly. The next slide you see is actually a, uh, a guidebook. A guidebook actually meant for the normal people. Uh, for if you're a developer, if you are, uh, it's not meant for the expert. It's actually for, for made, made by the expert for anybody to use. It's one of the best books. Uh, available uh, for your planning of elevators and it's a good guide to follow so I would advise everyone to actually look at it and use it it's it's very important there are three parameters uh, which are discussed uh, normally in the industry three major parameters which have to go right uh, and which you have to select yourself and make sure that that goes right the first one is interval Interval is the average time between departures uh, of elevators from the lobby. It is very similar to buses on, this, on, on, on the roads here. Uh, every 15 minutes a bus leaves from this station. Uh, we tend to be more in seconds, so every so many seconds there should be an elevator leaving from the lobby. It's a very important parameter and I'll come back to that. Handling capacity. Now, handling capacity is actually the number of passengers transported up with an 80% car load. Now, that's completely fictional. You don't have that in a building. There's never a pure uptick in a building. Yeah, there's always other traffic there as well. But it's a very good model to be able to dimension. It's also easy to calculate. And as I will show you a little bit later, it actually corresponds very well with the reality we have. Uh, the last one is not used that often, but it's sometimes still mentioned. And for example, it's mentioned somehow in that same book which I read earlier. Uh, it is the nominal travel time, which is the height of the building divided by the speed, the rated speed of that elevator system. Uh, that gives you actually a selection criteria for which speed to select. It's, it's, it has a very big impact on service level, and you will see that later here as well. Let's go to the first one, interval. The average time between departure of elevators from the lobby. If it's too short, meaning elevators leave extremely often, uh, they never get time to fill up because there are not enough people arriving. Uh, that is very comfortable because you've got empty cars, but it is expensive, extremely expensive. If you have it too long, 
then uh, you have to wait. You see that gentleman there? Is it coming? Still not here? Still not here? Yeah, you have, you have very long waits. But it has another problem. You know, every batch of persons coming should be transported up, otherwise we start getting queues. So if you have long intervals, the automatic consequence of that is also that you need large cars, and that's also expensive. Yeah, so, so that last one, having too long intervals, is definitely not a situation we'd like to have. And you see here the, the advices which we normally give. We normally go to the good values. So for a, uh, a commercial building, it should be something between 25 and 32 seconds, which gives you an average weight of about 60-70% of that, about 20 seconds. Yeah, so this is typically how we look at these buildings. Uh, I have seen them extremely long here, extremely long. Yeah, and it's, it's no fun waiting. Uh, for residential buildings, we can wait longer. So we will allow higher values. But it, I see, for example, in the Western world that we are shifting more and more to shorter waits. Uh, even though we do allow them longer, but the shift is towards excellence at the moment. Handling capacity. Oops, that's too many. Handling capacity. If your handling capacity is too small, you simply can't fit. You start getting cues. It's extremely uncomfortable. I see it a lot here. Really a lot here in India. Uh, if it's uh, too big, yeah, that's comfortable. You have all the space in the world in that car, but it's also expensive, pretty expensive. We tend to go to the minimum of good here. So I'll turn my back to you, sorry for that. But we go to this uh, minimum of good, which, hello. Can you put this one up? Thank you. Uh, so we go to the minimum of good, which uh, for a single company with common working hours is roughly around 16% of the population in a five minute period. So you should be able to transport 16% of the population in a five minute period. That's pretty, pretty big. Uh, one company with flexible, around 13. Multiple companies with common working hours, around 13. And multiple companies with flexible working hours, around 12. And you hear a lot of uh, international consultants talking about 12 to 13, yeah? which is quite normal in the, in the industry. Of course, it could be bigger. Yeah? But at least you should have the minimum of good. With hotels, it could be around 12. Residential, public, five. And for private, between seven, seven and a half around there. And hospitals, for example, 13. Uh, those are just values, but I'm going to show you here with the next slide uh, why these values are there. This is a typical single tenant building with common working hours. These are actually measured curves, which we have measured from, from real data. And this is an up peak, around 8% maximum of the population. This vertical axis is the population in five minutes moving. You have the percentage of the population in five minutes moving, and this is the time of day. So in the morning, you get a spike around 8, and you have another spike when people come back from lunch. Down, you have the clear spike in, uh, when people uh, get hungry, and we do get hungry all at the same time. That's a feature all over the world. Uh, we do finish our work, so usually this is a little bit higher than, than, than that spike here. This is a single tenant building, a lot of interfloor traffic, a lot of interfloor traffic because uh, we know the people and we go to them, we have meetings together. Another issue which we often see here is that during lunch this increases. And why is that? John, I'll pick you up and let's go for lunch together. Yeah, that, that happens quite a lot in, in office buildings, especially uh, single-tenant uh, office buildings. So we often see this increase in spike of, internet, of interfloor traffic. Put it all together, and you get the total traffic curve like this. And in this building, we had 14% of the population moving in a five-minute period. Now, this is mixed traffic. Half of it is upwards, so from the interfloor, half is up and half is down. So half of the traffic is up and half is down. Now, in a normal up peak, when we make a calculation, we make a lot of stops on the way up, and we go fast down. Now, if we do that, uh, if we do this, we have actually a lot of stops on the way up and a lot of stops on the way down. Both directions, we're slow. We're not on full speed. 
So uh, the automatic conse consequence of that is that we should actually have a little bit more than the value here, uh, uh, given here for, for up peak. So if we have here 14, we should do an up peak calculation made approximately a percent more. So it should be about 15, very close to that 16% which I gave you. Actual measured things show very, very exact data. Here we go to a multi-tenant office building. Total traffic here being allowed 11. Again, because it's mixed traffic during lunch, uh, we have to add a little bit more, so around the 12%. Again, it corresponds very much with those international standards we have seen. If we have here a residential building, four and a half, its majority is down, so adding about half a percent extra on that would give you about the right value. Again, the 5% for public, but that car is packed. Yeah? So if you want to get a bit more space, like in private, you go for a bit more space. 7%, seven, 7.5% seven is pretty good for these kind of buildings. The last curve here is a high-res hotel. And again, we've got the morning, we've got the evening, we're with a lot of restaurants, etc. going on. Uh, we reach 10% of the population moving. In this, this is a high-res high uh, hotel in Cairo. And adding, again, because this is very heavy mixed, uh, adding about 1% extra on it, 11, so the 12% for the, for the hotels is actually a bit on the tight side, even because we don't have a lot of space left. Yeah, so this, these curves, which we actually have measured, and we have hundreds of these kind of curves, correspond damn well with what we have been using in the industry as the standards. Uh, again, one, one way of showing that, that what we have, what we know about infrastructure is, is, is well known, and, and we, it is based on actual facts. Nominal travel time. Nominal travel time, if it is extremely short, we got super high speed. Super high speed. That is, you have to start looking at things like the ride comfort. Uh, you have to do a little bit more work than normal. Uh, not only that, but you also have high power motors, expensive drives. So it, it is expensive. It's a lot more expensive than, than uh, selecting a little bit lower speed. So too short, Nominal travel time, no good. Too long, on the other side, gives you a lot of time to sleep. Yeah? This gentleman there, it's going to take him ages to go there. So, too slow is no good. Not, not really good, but it has a very big effect on the service level of a building. And I'm going to show you that now. But uh, first, let's look at the values. For a commercial building, 20 to 25 is quite good. So, if you have a 100 meter high building between uh, four and five meters per second. On a residential, it can be much less, so about 25 to 32. Here in India, I would say, because we are so much in the, in, uh, at the low end of the speeds, I would, I would accept even satisfactory. Uh, yeah, that, that could, that, that this place is quite low with speeds. And I'm gonna show you some examples here. These are, these are actual cases which we have seen here in India. Uh, a famous architect here in Mumbai, he's very famous actually, this gentleman, he's using 50,000 square foot per elevator. And if you calculate that, I can tell you even the double deck elevator is in trouble. Yeah? So single deck elevator, there's no chance on earth it can handle the traffic. Yeah? There's simply no way it can handle the traffic. I see other people using 10% in five minutes. That's a little bit more reasonable. Uh, I see intervals being used of 40 seconds for offices. That's a bit long, yeah? but again, as I said, in, here in India, we could maybe allow a little bit more to the satisfactory side. This is on the end, edge of satisfactory. Uh, I also see a lot of buildings, high-rise buildings, being calculated at 5% handling capacity for offices. Offices are our biggest problem here, actually. Yeah? It's really bad, and I've seen people waiting sometimes for over 25 minutes. It's really bad. Residential. Uh, in the early stages of one high-rise tower here, very famous tower here, they were looking at scenic elevators going one and a half meters per second, going 300 meters up. And that takes seven minutes before this bloody elevator is finally back to ground. And it was quite small, actually, so it's, it's simply undoable. It's really a waste of your money. That poor restaurant guy there at the top, or club guy at the top, he's, he's running out of business. No business for him. 
Same problem as human by street, it just takes too long. Uh, they had the main passengers running at four meters, going 300 meters. That's ridiculous. It's really, really too low. It just takes ages and ages and ages to do it. Hotels. One hotel which I saw just lately on my last trip, 130 meters with a speed of two and a half meters per second. It's a five-star hotel. Now, I'll show you the consequences of this. This is too small handling capacity, these kind of values. This is done with 5% handling capacity. The green curve is the 5% handling capacity. The purple curve is the correct. Now, if you look at this, uh, we find waiting times up to 1,400 seconds. It's over 25 minutes. It's terrible. It's really terrible. Uh, if you do it, this is the same curve, but uh, amplified a bit. Uh, if you do look at the purple curve, you never go over the 30 seconds, and the average is something like uh, 12, 15 seconds. Much better. Much, much better. And not only that, but this takes four hours. That takes several hours to get rid of those queues. So what people do, they start walking. And that's even slower than the elevators, by the way. Uh, if you look here, that same green curve gave us that 80% of the calls were longer than 10 minutes. People waited more than 10 minutes. 20% of the people. That's, that's undoable. That's money lost all the time. Offices are expensive. If you look at the high-rise buildings, the largest part of the, of the money is salaries. It's extremely important to get that right. If you look at, uh, for example, this here, uh, this is the hotel in Delhi, which I was talking about. This is the four meter side, this is the two and a half meter side. If you look at waiting times, the four meters had very short, very small high, high weights. This system here had 2.17%. And who are those people? Like in this hotel, the people in the club, the people who pay most. It's extremely expensive uh, to do that. And not only that, people take the elevators about six times a day in, in, in hotels. So you have a very good chance that you actually get into those very long waits. Not only that, but they're also extremely long inside the car. Roughly 11% of the population is actually more than a minute inside an elevator. So you wait long and you're there very long. And these guys are definitely the guys at the top. So that was traffic. The next very important thing in high-rise buildings is piston effect. Make sure that you have that right. Here in India, we are demanding single shafts. It seems to be a fire code here. I went to the fire officer uh, office yesterday, and they might just relax that. So please use that opportunity, because you're destroying your high-rise buildings. Piston effect will cause a lot of turbulent air around your car, uh, cause a lot of noise, uh, and, and the speed is more than twice the speed. And even if we use this kind of uh, uh, special spoiler systems around the car, we still have incredibly high speeds, especially in single shaft. This is a curve which we got out of wind tunnel tests at 8 meters per second. The ratio about 0.5, which is the common ratio for an elevator normally in the shaft. It takes about 50% of the, of the area. Uh, you'll see that the speeds are about 17 meters per second around the car. That causes a lot of noise, a lot of friction, everything. So it, it's definitely not the good way to go. And, and in, it, the higher the speeds go, uh, actually the pressure differences which we get are, are actually a function of speed cubed. Uh, squared, sorry. The speed squared. So, so they dramatically increase that turbulent noise. It's very important to get that right. Uh, what we should not do is make these walls solid. Keep them open. Make it a large space. We elevator companies will take care that the elevators are spaced correctly, that we don't run them side by side. We don't want to do it anyway because that's bad for traffic. Yeah? So we will prevent that. If you have this as divider beams between, you have a lot more uh, possibilities. You can get rescue between cars. You can put your toilets, for example, in, uh, in lobbies of express areas uh, with not, no, not having doors opening up into the toilets. Yeah, uh, for, for rescue. Uh, there's a lot of good things in this uh, stuff, and it keeps the, the noise down. You can't take them all down. We will have some fire, fire elevators, which need to be most probably in single shafts, but uh, the main passengers 
absolutely should not be in single shafts. That's very important. We have to get rid of this problem in India. This is one of the biggest problems here. If you have single shafts, you can get rid of the pressure by leaving pressure relief holes. You need to get them quite often because air actually compresses over a pretty short distance. So you have to have them quite often. And uh, they are big. They can be the size of a door. So it's not small. And you have to find a place where to dispatch it. And you may, you may need to put fire dampers in them if the fire brigade wants them there. Yeah? So it's very important that you have it right. But this is the only way you can get rid of that noise. Uh, by the way, if you cannot put them there, even put spoilers which will help you a little bit, uh, the next thing is it still doesn't remove the problem of air uh, being compressed or, or, being, or having lower pressure uh, on the other side. Uh, it causes the doors to bang, it causes uh, so buffeting, so you can, you can hear that buffeting. It will squeeze air with high speed through the doors, which you will hear as whistling. Uh, you won't get the quality out of it, so it's extremely important to have it right when you go to super fast speeds. And we see speeds of 8 meters per second coming now in India. Building sway, yep, I know. Building sway, also an important topic. Wind will induce sway on buildings. And not only that, that's very important for our equipment. It can go badly into resonance. Yeah, so it's take care of that. Make sure that we don't have those problems uh, with, with the ropes, with the compensation ropes, with the suspension ropes, with, with uh, cables and with, uh, with governor ropes. They can all sway. So it's very important to have that right. Uh, we can do all kinds of things. Here you see several meshes which we can do. We can add weight, we can add follower carriage. This will take more space. Uh, we can put all kinds of protection for ropes not hitting the cars. For example, governor, uh, counterweight ropes not hitting the car. We can even use devices to actually park in right spaces in non-resonant spaces uh, or even stop the elevator altogether, sway devices, uh, which we measure the frequencies and just make sure that uh, and the amplitudes, we know exactly what, what the building does actually. Uh, when we use these devices. It's very important that we know what to do so all these devices can be used in the right way. So we need from you always the lowest modes, especially in the bending modes, uh, in, in each direction of the building. So the first two bending modes in each direction, extremely important for us to get that right. Uh, stack effect, uh, that is uh, actually going to be worse when we open up those hoistways and finally get that better quality of elevators. Uh, if it's cold, like in Europe at the moment, uh, you normally have that it's uh, cold outside, warm inside, so you get a big buoyancy effect upwards. Uh, in warm weather, like here in India, it very often goes the opposite direction. You're cold inside, hot outside, and it goes down. Yeah? If we open up the hoistways for, better, for the better uh, quality, uh, elevators will open doors on different levels. Yeah, they will do that. So you will get very big stack effects going through the building, so you better close off your building. So one of the things which is very good, where very important with stack effects is seal your building correct. Now, I've seen a lot of buildings here, they're not well sealed. Yeah, so it's, it can cause problems later on, especially when we go to uh, systems like this where we have uh, improved quality of elevators. If you don't do it, this is what you can get, the combined effect. This is a job where, we are, where the travel is about 350 meters high. It's an uh, 8 meter per second job. Lateral quaking is uh, about 12 milligs in the worst spot, usually around, uh, I would say, about less than 10 milligs. Pretty good in a low wind day. Here's a heavy wind day, 70, 80 kilometers. The top floor was not sealed. Yeah? So the top floors were not sealed. So we had a stack effect, and we had the sway of the building. Here, we got levels of up to 70 milligs. Honestly, if you're in that car, scares the hell out of you. It really scares the hell out of you. You don't want to be in that car at that moment. Uh, the building is closed now. It's, it's great. Uh, we've even been able to add some software features there to get rid of that totally. And it's, uh, it's fantastic now. It, it does the same in high winds now, more or less. But uh, if you combine those two and you don't take everything into account, that's a serious, serious issue. So what I would like to say as a conclusion, Design rules for dimension vertical transportation in high-rise in India must be changed. You have to get it right. Otherwise, you have the same situation as on your roads. 
the, the, the infrastructure of your buildings must be well dimensioned. That's, those are expensive investments. Please, please don't spoil them. Uh, it would be good to use similar rules as those in the SIPSIC ID, the book I've shown there. It's very important. And uh, practice of using single hoistways should be banned, especially for the passenger elevators, uh, to prevent that piston effect. Building sway and stack effects must be considered. We should get your reports. It's very important for the elevator companies. And uh, there are a lot of excellent uh, international vertical transportation uh, consultants here. There will be, following, there will be some following me. And uh, please, 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 please use them. They're very good. Uh, they are extremely good. They know their jobs. They've done the major towers. Please use them. And uh, for example, there's some here sitting in the, in the, in the group here. So please use them. Thank you.